Okay, everybody, and now for the most important part of our evening, I would like to call to the podium Ann William. Ann is a most perfect representative from our organization to introduce tonight's puzzle expert and acclaimed scholar. And let me let Ann have the spotlight at this point. Thank you, Ann. Thank you. So, the AGPC has been giving the Spillsbury Award since 2001. And um, since you were all at the Coatsen Library yesterday, you know that um, many people uh, in England uh, claim that Spillsbury was the inventor of the jigsaw puzzle. He called them dissected maps, and he sold them to English aristocrats in the 1760s. And these aristocrats, because their kids were going to be running the uh, empire, wanted their kids to understand geography. Now, there are a whole group of other people, particularly people from Europe, who scoff at the claim that Spillsbury invented the jigsaw puzzle. Um, they are certain that the jigsaw puzzle originated in a different country, and there are several different contenders for the, um, that location. A third view that I find most persuasive is one expressed by Tom Tyler some years ago when we were all in London. And he said, well, really, the true inventor of the jigsaw puzzle was that person who received a letter, tore it up, threw it in the wastebasket, and then said, oh, I need that letter. <laughs> so they fished it out of the wastebasket, and they probably didn't have scotch tape back then, but they you know, reconstructed the letter uh, because they thought it would be a useful record. Now, whatever the true story is, um, it is it, one thing is clear about Spillsbury. Uh, he was well documented uh, and in contemporary documents. He commercialized the jigsaw puzzle in a way that some of the other contenders did not. And his puzzles still exist. So some of the uh, contenders for the title of inventor, uh, there, there's, no there's no physical evidence of, of their puzzles. Now this evening it gives me great pleasure to introduce Garrett Beckering. He is the sixth recipient of the AGPC Spillsbury Award. And he will address some of the issues that I have just been mentioning about who invented the jigsaw puzzle. But before I give the microphone to Garrett, I want to talk a little bit about his accomplishments. I first learned of Garrett and Betsy Beckering and their jigsaw puzzle collection almost 30 years ago in 1987. Any guesses as to who told me about them? Uh, Tom Tyler. Chuck oh, no. Chuck Small? No, no, no. Bruce. Bruce. Jerry Slocum. Uh, yes. Jerry Slocum at that time had the most amazing uh, uh, network of information, and he still does. Uh, and he mentioned that he'd had some correspondence with the Beckerings. And so um, this was at a time when the internet had not yet reached me. I, I believe that Al Gore had had his hands on it already, but um, anyway, it was still in its infancy. So I wrote a letter, and in due course, I received a letter in return. And I learned that the Beckerings were in the process of preparing their first major exhibition of jigsaw puzzles. 
and also that their book on the history of Dutch jigsaw puzzles, I'm sorry, it was, it was the history of puzzling in the Netherlands, um, was about to be published. So I ordered the book, and that was the beginning of uh, almost three decades of correspondence and friendship. Uh, in 1995, I met Garrett in person when his teaching responsibilities brought him to the United States. Uh, and after finishing his professorial responsibilities, he traveled some. He visited um, members Kay and Graham Curtis in Illinois. Um, and then he traveled to Maine and spent almost a week in which the two of us visited virtually every um, important uh, puzzle-related site in Maine, Vermont, uh, New Hampshire, Massachusetts. We didn't get down to Rhode Island and Connecticut. The only um, non-puzzle-related site we visited was Best Buy. <laughs> and we went to Best Buy because Garrett had been instructed by one of his children not to come back without a Walkman. Uh, so, but we, we did have to make time for that. Then, uh, nine years later, I met Betsy when I visited the Beckerings in the Netherlands. And they, in turn, spent a week taking me to museums in the Netherlands and in Germany. It was, uh, for me, it was a mind-boggling experience. And on these, visit, on these two visits, I got to know Garrett a little better as a person. And um, I learned that, and Betsy too, uh, I learned that uh, he earned a master's degree in biology at the University of Utrecht. He spent most of his long career teaching human anatomy and physiology at the Saxion University in Enschede. Uh, he speaks at least four languages that I know of. He is so fluent in English that for several years he was instructing visiting American students in English in um, his specialty. Uh, his marriage to um, Betsy was uh, blessed with a son and a daughter, and more recently, four grandchildren. Now that's pretty important. <coughs> What's more important to us here tonight is that um, his marriage set him on a puzzling path. He was unfamiliar with um, wooden jigsaw puzzles, but Betsy's family had a long tradition of, of doing wooden jigsaw puzzles, and Garrett was immediately um, entranced by these jigsaw puzzles. So uh, over the years, um, they um, enlarged their own collection of jigsaw puzzles. They visited museums and private collections throughout Europe to study and inventory those puzzles. Um, they uh, traveled to England to meet with Linda Hannes, the premier author on jigsaw puzzles, early jigsaw puzzles in England. And uh, they realized there was nothing comparable to her scholarship on the continent yet. Um, so, over the past 30 years, they have curated numerous puzzle exhibitions in the Netherlands, Belgium, and Germany. Now, I had some information about these exhibitions, but I was pretty sure I didn't know it all. So I, I asked Gerd to send me a list of all the exhibitions. And I didn't hear from him. He just didn't respond. Uh, finally, after several weeks, he said, well, I've had to do a lot of um, searching to find all the records on our exhibitions. And uh, he um, finally sent me a list. It included seven exhibitions in Dutch museums, uh, five in German museums, um, and in addition, they have loaned jigsaw puzzles to Specialized exhibitions on naval history, military history, um, uh, toys in general, and, and many special themes. Uh, they've loaned objects in order to round out those exhibits. The two most important ex 
ex exhibitions, I think, in Kurt's mind are the 1988 exhibit at the Daventer Toy Museum, not too far from his home, and the one um, in Sonneberg, Germany, um, in 2004. The Daventer exhibit was the one that was um, going on when I, is that the one that was going on? Yeah, when I uh, first started corresponding with him. And it led to this book, um, and in case you're not familiar with Dutch, it is piece by piece, um, history of puzzling in the Netherlands. Uh, I'm not sure that's totally accurate. Gary can correct me. Um, when I went to um, visit them in 2004, they took me to Sonneberg, which is about 80 miles north of Nuremberg. Uh, Nuremberg, you probably know, is famous for the annual winter toy fair, where the toy market is uh, basically conducted. The, the vendors set up and the, um, the buyers come. Uh, but Sonneberg was one of the historic places for production, as opposed to commerce. Um, it, going back a couple of centuries, uh, well known for its wooden toys, and initially an industry that was conducted in, basically in a few factories and a lot of home um, uh, cottages where people would make uh, these wooden toys and then uh, would sell them to the distributors. The um, Sonneberg was, um, has a, also ha houses the German Toy Museum, an immense structure with four floors that chronicle all aspects of the toy industry. And it was with the Sonneberg exhibition that his second book came out uh, on Let's see, this is, um, I have to read the translation here. Fun and Patience, the History of German Jigsaw Puzzles. Um, the first book he wrote with Betsy, um, the second book he wrote himself. Um, I believe Garrett, maybe if you're interested in acquiring either, either of these books, you should talk to Garrett because I think he may still be able to um, help you out. Beyond the books, Garrett has written extensively on European jigsaw puzzles for many population, uh, many publications. He's a regular contributor to the AGPC Quarterly and to the BCD Newsletter. He, his articles have appeared in journals devoted to maps and map history, the history of the chocolate industry, um, many, many diverse fields. For many, many years, he had a major leadership role in the Dutch Cube Club and edited the newsletter of that group. He's also a member of the Ephemera Society, the Early Children's Book Society, and the Cartographic Society. Um, he and Betsy are interested not just in puzzle history, but in other aspects of puzzles. For many years in the 1990s, they organized an annual puzzle competition in near Amsterdam. Since he, um, uh, or as he re approached retirement age and retired, Gerd has become very involved in researching the history of Enschede and the area around it, and is an active member of the Historical Society. He and Betsy have a deep love for nature and a commitment to improving the environment. They love to spend time outdoors. Um, much to my surprise, I, I wasn't really prepared. They said when I visited in 2004, well, we set aside a day for hiking. And then they got out their hiking boots. Well, I was wearing my sneakers. And they looked at my feet with a very worried expression. Uh, and had me out all day on a 10 mile hike. <laughs> um, indeed, we weren't entirely certain that we could persuade them to join us tonight um, because they would have had to fly by air and air travel has such a large carbon footprint. 
But they plan to spend most of their time after tomorrow hiking around the United States so to make up for the carbon footprint. Uh, they now own about 4,000 jigsaw puzzles. Like many collectors of a certain age, they are now in the process of reviewing their collection, um, deaccessioning the less interesting specimens, and this is, as you know, this can be a very time-consuming process. So I, I didn't, in addition to the Spilsbury Award, I wanted to present them with something a little more useful, and I didn't want to give them another puzzle because they already have plenty of puzzles. So, Garrett and Betsy, would you just come up for a minute? Um, <laughs> not boots. I actually think what he's wearing is much more distinguished, but you can never have too many puzzle-themed ties. Um, <laughs> So, um, so on behalf of the of all the members of the AGPC, Garrett, and the basically the woman behind Garrett, um, I want to present you with this year's Spilsbury Award, uh, which honors your many years of of leadership and. Um, research and enthusiasm and spreading the knowledge about European jigsaw puzzles and their history. And uh, I also want to thank Mark, Mark Capitella who cut this award. Um, the um, central design is a tree that Betsy uses for her signature piece. And um, I also want to thank um, Bob Armstrong because uh, Mark um, had a few issues, shall we say, uh, that required the puzzle doctor's attention uh, before we could give this to Garrett. So um, congratulations, Garrett. Um, and this is a very well-deserved award. So, Garrett, I will turn the microphone over to you.
played in the Walton role. Her mother uh, had a um, couple of very special puzzles, and before she went to sleep, she did a uh, easy puzzle that is uh, a wooden puzzle, of course, 40 pieces or so, and she did them upside down. And many of these pieces got a special name: uh, the crooked one, the uh, the rabbit, etc. Et she knew them by heart. Uh, they, they were family to her, and she did just a puzzle to relax before she went to sleep. That's what I met when I uh, met Betsy. Came to know Betsy. I easily adapted to that, but. I have proved my skills in the end <laughs> <laughs> to win her hand because wooden puzzles played an uh, important role. Uh, well, normal puzzles, but that's his father was a very special and very good puzzler. He, he could assemble difficult puzzles. So one day, that's his father produced a heap of pieces his favorite puzzle and challenged me and said well if you can assemble that one so this is about the heap of pieces you see them it's all black yeah it's it's uh, after the cutting uh, it, it went into uh, a bath with black stain so yeah it, it's all bad it's a silver puzzle as you can Read it's okay, it's in German, but you understand that. And it tells you modernster Kopf Zerbrecher. Well, that translates into English is the most modern way to smash your head. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, it took me some time, yes, it did, but in the end, I could assemble it. And this is what came out. This is a boy with a donkey and a tree. Uh, it is a really nice puzzle and I did it more than once. And of course in the end you recognize several pieces and you know where to add them, etc. But yeah, well hard puzzle. Now the favorite puzzle that she and I make up, but you have seen that this afternoon is about the same type of silhouette puzzle. Yeah, um, <coughs> some of them. Yeah, that's the more devious one. And as, as we as explained, uh, she first starts cutting uh, the, the shape. Some of the pieces of wood that come out <coughs> here, she often puts on top of the puzzle, uh, makes a second or a third layer, and uh, she leaves away, etc., etc. It's, yeah, it's very good, but nice. Um, from 1984 on, we bought puzzles, yes, and we came across Linda Hennessy's book, and, well, it's a very good book, but <laughs> <laughs> we had met uh, Linda Hennessy, and she explained us on chapter 9 on foreign puzzles. Um, what happened, Linda Hennessy's husband was an antiquarian and he went throughout Europe to buy antiquarian books to sell them in England. And Linda Hennessy, on one of these trips, accompanied him to Paris, to Vienna, uh, Berlin and Amsterdam and on the way because she was in the process of producing that book. On the way, she tried to get to old puzzles. Well, she met a few puzzles that were completely different from the English puzzles. And so that's why she did add that book. And uh, uh, did add a chapter to the book. And, well, as little as we knew about continental puzzles in those days, we said chapter 9 is not the best chapter of Linda Hamilton. So we asked her what were your criteria to discriminate, well, 
for example, the age of a uh, uh, geographic jigsaw puzzle. She couldn't really explain. Mm -hmm. Now, she said before, an interlocking ball, you never see that before 1785, which is absolutely correct for the English jigsaw puzzles, but doesn't tell you anything on continental jigsaw puzzles. Uh, okay, so we set out, and uh, well, the conclusion was obvious. Uh, jigsaw puzzle history on the continent was different from England. Um, so we suggested that the jigsaw puzzle could have been invented by Koms and Mathieu, map makers in Amsterdam, because all the old cartographic puzzles we found in the Netherlands that were absolutely old were with maps of Koms and Mathieu. Well, we have a 1785 ad of Koms and Mathieu in the Amsterdam newspaper that they sell puzzles, jigsaw puzzles, yes, but not prior, no ad prior to 1785, but the maps they used were maps of about 1720, 1740. So our first hypothesis was Coase and Mathieu were the first to produce jigsaw puzzles. I can't prove that. No, I can't. There's no, as Anne explained, physical object to prove that. So what we did, we made inventories of many, many Dutch and German museum collections of uh, jigsaw puzzles. Yeah, that was the first thing to do. We started the Dutch Jigsaw Puzzle Club, Puzzle Guild, as we called it after the uh, English Guild. Um, 80 members now, and not many interested in real Jigsaw Puzzle history. The most of them in the modern Jigsaw Puzzles, comics, etc. Um, we had several exhibitions. Uh, we made a book on German history. Articles, lectures, etc., etc. We assisted happily enough. I don't have to do all the job myself. A Frenchman doing a book on French wooden puzzles. Yeah, that is nice. And okay, um, that's what Anne already told you. Uh, continuous research, yes, in all kinds of different fields. Uh, there's so many things I really like, but I almost never can finish a subject completely up to a publication. Well, today's lecture uh, presentation I will work out into a uh, article for the quarterly. But then the second half. We still hope that the Dutch will be a better. <laughs> Uh, no, no, but so far, <laughs> the Germans are ahead of us, because um, we found a quote that to teach children your geography in a playful way, I translated this from the German into English, um, you can Okay, and that's a textbook on geography teaching of 1720. In Enlightenment, it, that, that period, uh, um, education of young people was very important. Young people were no longer considered to be small adults. They were a species of their own, and they had been, to be treated in their own way, and a playful way of teaching was found sometimes better than learning a heart. <coughs> so yes, touching <coughs> things, feeling a shape of a country, etc., was important. Fitting two countries to each other, seeing that there actually is a river in between, etc., that became important, practical examples, what 
an island, okay, you put a piece of paper, you let it float on water. These are really examples from literature that says, oh, that's an island. And when it floats to the border of the, the tin with water, you say, and now it's a peninsula, because it's connected to the mainland. Uh, well, that, that kind of teaching was used in Enlightenment. Um, no longer just learning by heart, but telling something around it. Uh, what's this country famous for? For wool production. Why is that? Because they have so many sheep. But how come? Well, because there's heather and sheep are the only animals to feed on heather. Yeah. Okay, that's all right. Now, that kind of relations. Um, they did that in environment, logic, reasoning, uh, touching, and, and that's literal one uh, kind of education in Germany is literally named after the touching, the getting, the, the, the feeling. So, yes, that's the real schule. That's the real thing you have to feel, to see, to smell, to etc. Um, in those days, the puzzle must have played its first role, the geographical puzzles. <coughs> are there any precursors? Yes, of course. Yes, there are. 1644, a Jean de Marais designed teaching games, card games, for the education of Louis XIV, the French king. <coughs> and there were two games on history, but also one game on geographical and one on oh, which meant, okay, yeah, Greece was important in those days, and uh, Rome as well. The Marat geographical card came, had one country on each card, and I don't have pictures of his game, but there's another comparable game by James Markson, it's a little later, and you see that there are countries or continents, each but on a card. And you can play card games, it's, you see, it's normal cards, it's normal symbols, etc. But the teacher, the tutor, could also ask, tell me something about. And so it, it was a teaching aid as well. Uh, then Jacob Lidl, he made this wonderful card of the central countries, Hungary in the middle uh, of Europe. Uh, well, it's, it's stretching at the uh, top right there, you can see the crim that Putin has taken for for Russia now from okay doesn't matter um, <laughs> what you see is that the cards uh, the, the map can put up in little pieces and at the back side of these pieces you see the normal playing card symbols so yes it's a map you can assemble and it's playing cards at the same time. We don't call it a jigsaw puzzle so far, but precursor. Um, that's uh, eight playing cards on the way first. Yeah. Um, what's more, there's a little text with it, and it says it's specially made for teachers and youth. Mm -hmm. So that's in the Enlightenment period. Uh, fits in that. That's more well known, I think, a geographical goose game, and still not fitting, it's one country per field, but there again you have to tell something about the country when you land on a field. Uh, oh, this one is 1662. Okay. Um, so now I have to come up with a definition of jigsaw puzzles. Because if these other were precursors, what then is a jigsaw puzzle? 
I tried the most strict definition I could find, and we can discuss that because there are no correct definitions, I know. Uh, one original and presumably flat, not three-dimensional, <laughs> deliberately cut into pieces with the intention to have it reassembled. Would, would that do for the time being? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you can come up with, uh, with special things that fit into the definition and are not a jigsaw puzzle. I'm sure. You're creative enough. Um, who did invent the jigsaw puzzle? It could have been Madame de Beaumont. Uh, that was a French teacher of the English king, among mm. others. It could have been Jacob Little again. Uh, Hauber, I come to Hauber again. Charlotte Finch, who had the jigsaw puzzle cabinet. Uh, the other we didn't see the other day in the Cotson. The one he tried to buy. Well, actually, he bought it in auction. But then, all of a sudden, the English government decided that this was English history and they had to buy it from Carson to keep it in England. <laughs> well, okay. Uh, that's the Charlotte Finch cabinet. It can have been John Spilsbury, maybe Kovac and Martina, but I don't have proof of that. Um, Hauber, so far, is my best candidate. Because he did write a book on teaching geography, in 1725, and that's for those people who know some German, <laughs> the literal uh, description of what he tells. Well, I assume you better do that in English. <laughs> yeah. He lists a few methods to the teacher, and one of the methods is we can add to instruct children easy and almost playfully, the next one, where we could cut apart the provinces of a country on a map along the boundaries, hustle them, whereupon one instructs the pupils to arrange the pieces properly and have them reassembled. Hauber doesn't boast on it. It's just one way, he has six different ways, and this is, well, accidentally called, well, this is another way to do it. So that must have been an inventor earlier than Hauber, and Hauber just mentioning this way. But so far, he's my best candidate for invention. Now, is there, could there be any relation in between Hauber and the English royal family? Because the oldest practical evidence, physical evidence we have for it are the Spilsbury puzzles. And those are used also in the royal family in England. Well, Mr. John Caprat, uh, well, there's a lot of data in it, was an effective leader of the country when Spencer Compton was the Prime Minister. This, this is all from the internet. It's not <laughs> very important. He had several good connections with Germany and he was befriended to George I. And you might realize that George I was Georg der Erste. <laughs> From Hamburg. <laughs> yes, he actually was German and he didn't speak much English. No. And he took with him several, well, advisors, teachers, etc. from Hamburg. Hmm? Uh, Hanover, sorry, sorry, yeah, thank you, Beth. And they spoke mainly German. Well, John Carteret married to a Sophia Ferber, and that links the Pomfret family to the Ferber family, 
and they were related to the Finch family. And Charles Finch was the one who taught the George II, the, the Brown Prince at the time. So, yes, there is a relation. We don't know exactly whether these people meet, met regularly, but yes, that's, that's likely. The daughter of um, Charlotte Carteret got instructions of Madame de Beaumont. And we know Madame de Beaumont in London was a teacher in the upper circles. And she had her own school. And when you went to that school, one of the things you had to buy before you could enter the school was a wooden map. A wooden map can have been just a map pasted to wood, period. But we know there's a letter prior to 1760 of one of the pupils that writes to his father, I'm missing the county of, well, such and so. So the wooden map actually must have been, there's no 100% proof, but can have been a dissected wooden map in the Madame Beaumont environment. So, yes, and she did teach Lady Charlotte Finch, <coughs> and then the circle is round. Now we get to a uh, last nice thing, that librarian Wettstein Switz, and he uh, in Switzerland they speak three languages, I know, but he's German speaking, um, was also librarian to the Prince of Wales, that is the Crown Prince, that's uh, George II. Uh, that's Caspar Wettstein, and Madame Le Prince de Beaumont did meet in 17. 49 at home of Lord uh, Carteret. We know that from written evidence. So, yes, it becomes clear that it's not a two wide circle. Uh, they all knew each other. And Librarian Wettstein did buy geographical books and maps for the Prince of Wales. He can have bought, we don't know exactly, but can have bought Hauger's book with this phrase of, etc. 1725 uh, book. It, it was a frequently used book on teaching geography. Uh, yes, it was popular. It was on book, as the French say. Wettstein did teach Latin and the much more to the young princes, but they didn't like him. <laughs> no. So he was fired. Uh, he was associated with unpleasant teaching. That's, that's a nice way to formulate it. <laughs> yeah. And then, 1744, he sends from Basel, Switzerland two geographical puzzles to the princess and writes a letter to the Swiss governess. He is replaced by a woman. And he explains that he sends these puzzles because Prince Edward did tell him that he did not like Switzerland. So he asks the governess not to tell the princess this present came from him. <coughs> But playing with these games would improve the sense of geography. These are his little words. So yes, we're talking about the geographical jigsaw puzzle in 1744. <coughs> That's far before John Spilsbury, isn't it? And in the cabinet of Lady Charlotte Finch, we find Several puzzles that are not John Spilsbury puzzles. 
And one of these puzzles is missing a very small piece, a piece of Switzerland. That's oh. not a surprise. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Madame de Beaumont uh, had the wooden maps. One of the pupils writes that he made lost around the overture. Oh, okay. I told you that. And that's the cabinet of Lady Charles Finch. And, okay, in one of these puzzles, we miss Switzerland. <laughs> yep. Okay. Uh, there are a lot of John Spilsbury puzzles in the cabinet. Yes. Uh, you know all about John Spilsbury now, since you were in the Castle Library. Uh, this is the very solid proof that Linda Hand has found. So, I did find claims in letters, etc., but so far not a puzzle, a geographical jigsaw puzzle, with a name, with a label on it, claiming that it's older than 1760. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, this picture I got from London, and it's very nice of the people that I got it. I called two or three or four times, and in the end, I found a young lady that said, uh, the old, old said, uh, no, we don't have anything on Spilbury. Um, I asked for a, a picture of, of the person, and in the end, I found someone who said, oh, yes, yes, we do have a picture. Mm. But John Spilbury had a brother, Jonathan, and they both were uh, artists. They made portraits. So, at the back of this portrait is written Spilsbury. <laughs> <laughs> it can be a portrait of someone else made by Spilsbury. Or it can be a portrait by John, made of Jonathan, Jonathan made of John, or whatever. <laughs> anyway, it's a young man at the right age. It could have been John Spilsbury. This could have been his portrait. And I'm sorry, but I'm not allowed to print this. Uh, well, when I do, I have to pay a lot of money, but you might look at it. <laughs> yeah, um, the maps, you may have noticed that Spilsbury did a good job on the maps. He left much out. He did a few cities, he did rivers, but no mountains, no... Uh, not too much details, it, it was just maps to teach the basic elements. That, that's a good thing. Uh, I found proof of um, about a hundred years later that they still care for that. Not just an ordinary map for grown ups, but design a special map for the youngsters. Don't overwhelm them with information. Uh, Don Spilsbury did that very well. Um, some extras. This is a uh, well-known picture, I think, of two boys uh, assembling a jigsaw puzzle. Yep, these uh, are the young masters, uh, Fonts and John Quick. Yep. The picture is 1770. Um, we found many map puzzles of Covers and Martyr, 1720. We don't know when they were cut up. Uh, what we found is that the information on the maps is not valid anymore around 1785. Not at all. All of the West Coast of America is missing, for example. Yeah. So were you, when you were rich enough to have a private teacher to your son, we're not talking about daughters, I'm sorry, uh, and to buy a jigsaw puzzle, geographical jigsaw puzzle, uh, buy a jigsaw puzzle with a 60 year out of date map. Mm -hmm. Well, some people say, yes, no problem, it's just for the basics. <laughs> it's, it's not a proof, I know. Um, yeah, first advertisement in the end of the newspaper, 1785. I can't get for that. 
No. And then this dish you had on the quarterly, okay, that's a Spanish prince, and he was of the Bourbon family, and the piece he's holding in hand, this is quite picture of a frame puzzle, that's the frame where you have to put in the countries. Um, the piece that he holds in hand is a piece of the area around Madrid that he owns. Uh, that's a claim. However, his father was a priest. He wasn't supposed to be alive. But, uh, <laughs> Oh. <laughs> Catholic priests don't have children, isn't it? <laughs> uh, so he, he never brought that. Um, yeah, Louis Maria de Bourbon y Valabrica. And I don't know whether my pronunciation is correct, but um, yeah. Uh, the province of Madrid, yeah, Bishop of Madrid. He, yeah, bishop. Hmm. Good. Yeah. So, uh, most likely a German invention. Anyway, mentioned in 1725 in a German book on teaching geography. And to teach and amuse the young people, that's the phrase in that book. Yeah, really useful games. Yes. Spilsbury was the most successful commercial producer of early dissected puzzles. He absolutely was. He did a good job. I can't imagine what would have happened when he didn't die so young as he did die. Uh, no, no, no. It's, it's an iffy question. I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's a pity he died so young. And. Uh, yeah, really useful. I'm deeply honored with my John Spilsbury Award, and I'm very thankful I got it. Thank you. <laughs> And she said, when touring around, also in England, 
I found many geographical jigsaw puzzles with maps much older than John Spilsbury's maps. But that never is the, uh, the data of a maker on the box or on the puzzle or whatever. So yes, Linda Hennis was also well aware that there could have been other, uh, all the puzzles. So what is the earliest continental puzzle that has a date? Um, I think about 1780. Uh, provable. Because I have several COVID and material puzzles in my own collection that could be older than that. Uh, proven 1760, uh, 80. Uh, in uh, catalogues of a, oh goodness, how's that called? Um, you get a catalog at home and you can order uh, uh, mail on catalogues. Yeah, yeah, Cattell and Bestmeyer catalogues, German catalogues. And they mention that uh, John Spil uh, uh, sorry, uh, Jerry Slogan had a, uh, a book on that. Uh, they mention specific maps, the most new map by Mr. So-and-so of the, that new uh, geographical situation. And then in the second line, and a puzzle of the same map you could all but it's 7080. Yep. Yeah. Can you go back to the two maps side by side of North America on the show? North and South America, the continental map. Which is in the West Coast now. Yeah, the one on the right is the Bonzi Mueller map. And that's very early. Uh, and the left is the follow-up to the Bozzi Mueller, uh, where California has finally hitched to North America. But, yep. Uh, but yep. That's, I don't know why they've been using that early map. That's mm -hmm. Much ahead, you know, yeah, yeah. older than... Uh, the Coves and Martia uh, jigsaw puzzles I have, uh, that's with uh, maps of De Lille, uh, map maker De Lille, yeah. also French map maker. Uh, those are 1720, and uh, not even California is, uh, right. is shown. You know, and for example, uh, Australia and New Zealand are on, only partly shown, etc. So, when do you date the one on the right, the Bonzi Miller? Um, the one where California is an island. Yeah. yeah what what I, date is that one? I've seen that, but here it's, it's part of the continent. Oh, okay. yeah. Another question, Bob? No, no. no. Okay, thank you.